Hey, fanboy nation. This is your pal Daffy Duck, and you're watching. You're watching. We're watching. You're watching. Fanboy. 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 A fanboy, etc. Fanboy nation. Dot. I assume. Uh, um. <laughs> This morning, I have the great pleasure of speaking with one of the directors of The Outsider, Stephen Rosenbaum. Here we are talking about the 9-11 Museum in New York and this 20-year process as we're actually coming up on the 20th anniversary of the towers coming down. Stephen, how are you today? You know, I'm good, and I appreciate you taking the time to ch chat about this. It's not an easy topic. You know, the world is not an easy place. Um, very rarely do we pay attention to the rest of the world, uh, let alone our own backyard. You know, a couple of weeks ago, we just ce uh, celebrated, commemorated, excuse me, um, the bombing in Beirut that, that happened on uh, August uh, 8th last year. Um, you know, the one that took place at the pier and basically blew up the, uh, the entire shoreline. Um, you know, the, this happened to us 20 years ago in New York City. Uh, which united the country, which we were on the verge of where we are today. And God forbid this happens again, so it, it'll cause us to unite. Um, the process took forever to get the 9-11 Museum up. John Stewart was a huge proponent of it, especially for the firefighters. And what, what was the main catalyst? I'm sorry, not catalyst, but what was the main problem in taking so long to get this done is it just bureaucracy and red tape that caused all these problems? So it's a great question. Let, let me start by promising your audience this. Um, the film is, while it's framed around 9-11, it's the story of one character, our protagonist. And he's a complicated dude. Uh, his name is Michael Shulin. He's the creative director of the museum. And he comes in very wide-eyed and optimistic and then over time uh is pretty di disappointed you know historians will tell you it was built too soon that you know history doesn't begin for 20 years is the basic truism of history this last two decades has essentially been current events and if you think about many of the things in american history world war ii vietnam you know uh what happened in 69, it takes a period of, it takes some distance to be able to get far enough away from it to be able to look back and go, oh, that's what happened. And I guess we started out to make the film with the understanding that we had extraordinary access to what was going to be clearly a highly visible world site. But it wasn't until we were about halfway through making it that we're like, boy, all of our characters seem unhappy. Like they're not, they're not all of them, but many of them don't like the direction this is going in. And that really caused us to stop and consider whether the museum they were building was the Museum American needed. You know, you know, you say that we need to pull back and some people said it was too soon. But if we go back, you know, 80 to 100 years, you know, All Quiet on the Western Front was written during World War I. We made so many movies about World War II during World War II, and then for the next 80 years afterwards. How is something considered too soon? You know, is it because people were considered too close to home in this? And how do you go from optimist? They always say a cynic is, uh, began as an optimist or as a disillusioned optimist. Um, how does that work in Michael's case? You know, I don't want to I don't want to give away too many spoilers because I want people to see the documentary, which is absolutely fascinating. Um, but, you know, it, it's still a close to home thing. And then on top of that, how big America is, it almost feels so removed from the West Coast because it happened to you guys in New York while we're three hours di difference in California. And we might as well be on another continent at this point. So. What the movie tried, tries to do, and thank you for saying that it's a good film. I mean, we're still, we're still not there yet. I mean, you know, everybody we talk to, I mean, you're, I think we've had 20 people see it so far. And so every time we talk to somebody, we keep waiting for them to say, you know, I was really disappointed. And we're like, oh, so far, the feedback from museum curators, family members, 
historians and journalists has all been remarkably positive. And I think people appreciate being invited to watch the film and draw their own conclusions. And so, so Shulin, as the creative director, arrived and he said, I was hired to build a museum of questions. And we began with all of these question marks and over time they all became periods. And that really disturbs him. The fact that as opposed to inviting muse museum visitors to explore the story and come up with their own conclusions, that they're starting to be kind of didactic about delivering these facts. Like this happened, this happened, this happened. It was terrible. Um, we, we were punched, we got back up. Um, I, I think I'm enough of a student of history to know that over time, people's perceptions of things change. And I think 20 years is an ideal mile marker to say, all right, maybe it's time as a country and as a world to, you know, if you look at the last 20 years, you know, 9-11 triggered a whole series of things that people haven't really strung together. But, you know, this sense of fear and being kind of endlessly under attack and that we are in some danger and we need to defend ourselves really was born out of 9-11. You know, I, I'm a great cynic and not in the philosophical sense of, you know, I'm a great cynic philosopher. I, I'm a cynical person. And so the towers themselves initially attacked in 93 or 90, you know, early 90s and then mid 90s. And then finally 2001 and the United States goes, oh, my God, I can't believe this happened. Yet we've had surveillance on, on all of this for 15 years leading up to it. I'm sorry, for, you know, a decade yeah. leading up to it. And then on top of that, like for someone like me that saw, okay, this happened in 93 where they tried to take out the parking structure. This has happened in 97 when they tried to do this. And then 2001, they just flew the planes into the building. You know, when people lost their minds and go, I can't believe this happened. I said, well, if you had paid attention to the last decade, they were trying to do it for so long that my reaction was like, huh, they finally pulled it off. Not to, please don't think that like I was cynical on that like, and oh my God, it, it wasn't a tragedy and we lost so many people, you know, over 3000 people. But it was like, if we had paid attention to what happened in the previous decade that led up to it, we shouldn't have been as surprised that they were going to try it one more time. So there's a scene in the movie in which Michael Shulin talks about 93 and how bungled 93 was and how it should have been exactly that, a trigger for us of understanding of what was coming next. The museum's response when they saw the film was they wanted that scene taken out. But why would you want that taken out if you, you know, it's a part of the factor that led up to this eight, year, eight years prior? Well, it was puzzling to us as well. They said they felt that scene was defamatory and that it made the museum look bad. And like, we scratched our head. We're like, what? Like, Michael said these things, he's an individual. He, these things are on the record. And by the way, just to be clear about Michael's role in the film, uh, he's not a producer on the film. He wasn't in the edit room. We didn't speak to him as we were producing it. In fact, um, he only saw the poster and the title and the film, I think now five weeks ago. Um, had no idea that he was the title character. Um, and what he's since said is, um, he watched it twice um, and he said, there's nothing that I've said in the film that I would retract. Which as a filmmaker, like when we made a, we, we took a risk. You know, if, if I came and hung out in your neighborhood and interviewed a whole bunch of people and talked to you a little bit and talked to all your neighbors and then you found out that the film I was making was about you, um, that might take you back a little bit. Uh, he's been a good sport about that. Well, you know, I, I'm intrigued by the title itself. You know, it's so simple and it's so to the point, The Outsider. Like, were there other working titles that, that you were going about this? Or was this like the one that you had in mind from the get-go? No, hundreds of titles. Hun literally pages and pages and pages of titles. Um, here's the hard thing about 9-11. Um, if you say to most people, hey, I have a story about 9-11. Do you want to see it or watch it? They go like this. They put their hands up. Um, I was at a cocktail party at the Producers Guild in New York 
number of years ago and uh, across the room was Jim Cameron. Uh, and I'm not a shy person. So I walked up to him and I said, Jim, can I ask you a question about filmmaking? And he said, sure. I said, how do you make a movie in which everyone thinks they know the ending and people still want to watch the film? And of course I was talking about Titanic, uh, but I also meant my movie uh, because it was the problem we were struggling with, which was the minute you called it 9-11 or World Trade Center or September 11th or, or museum even, like people fill in those words with what they think they know. And so as the film began to kind of coalesce around Michael's story and, 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 and it became a, a, a journey that he takes, we realized that the thing about The Outsider was that first of all, it didn't give, I mean, if you look at the poster art, clearly the towers are in the background, but he's in the foreground and that's purposeful. Um, but also, um, I think what we came to believe is we're all a little bit outsiders in this story. You know, um, it's interesting that like, let's go back to, and I'm going to throw this into pop culture because this came out just a year or two after 9-11 attack, the first Spider-Man movie, they had to reshoot the entire ending because the towers were in the movie. And it seems like there's always this fear of showing that location and that area in New York City. Is it fear of political correctness? Like, you know, I, I've been to where the towers were a couple of years ago, and it's, you know, these fountains with giant holes in the ground as, as this memorial. And to me, I was like, if you're really going to memorialize these people, and this is the way my mind works, why not rebuild the towers, but one story taller as like, yeah, you may have knocked this down, but we're building it, we're building it back up and going uh, even higher. So let's talk about Spider-Man first. Um, I remember going to see that movie. Um, and I remember being, for reasons I can't, I have to go back and find it, incredibly angry. Um, I wanted it to be escapism. And there was just too much that felt like the towers to me. It, it, it was like PTSD for me. And I remember writing a post at the time about how much I thought the movie was disrespectful. Um, and mostly the comments in the post were like, um, get over yourself. Like, like I was too, like, so, so I remember that moment in time. Um, the, a couple of things about the site that you visited. First of all, you should know that the, when you're standing at those pools, you are standing on the roof of the museum. It's all underground. It's like if somebody dug a hole and then put a roof on it and then built a park on top of it. The names of those survivors that are around that, those pools um, were not supposed to be there. They were supposed to be underground at the bottom of the waterfalls. And there was ramps down to the waterfalls to be able to walk around the bottom where the water pours down on the names. And the families, or I never should say the families, a group of families sued and sued the Memorial and Museum and got the names brought up to above ground. Um, but that's the only, the only way you know that it's a memorial is if you know what those shapes mean and you know what those names mean. But if you were to take the next generation there, they'd be like, oh, there's fountains and some people's names. Like there's no, nothing says September 11th, nothing says 9-11 and the museum itself, which I assume you didn't go to, I didn't get a chance to, I was only there for half a day. So whenever I say that, people always answer with a little bit of like apology. They, you, you didn't go, if you think about all the museums in New York, they all have big banners on the front and they're all trying to get you. The 9-11 Museum, it, the fact that it's underground is, um, is as metaphors go, it's a pretty good metaphor. It's, the story is buried. And I was just going to say, why are we burying the story? Because if we go to Pearl Harbor, you know, yes, the USS Arizona is underwater, but it was sunk. And we could still go stand above it and see the Arizona just under our feet. Why is there, is it a sense of shame? Is there a sense of over political correctness for fear of Islamophobia? Like, what is the catalyst to hide everything? Is it because New Yorkers are so, you know, it, visually tough that they don't want to show any sign of weakness like I don't understand 
why that would be the case? Um, it's a good question and the museum explores that, um, but I'm not sure it answers it. Um, I, I'll, I'll, I'll give you my theory, but it's one man's theory. Um, you know, a big piece of lower Manhattan was destroyed and the economic impact on the city was crushing. Um, I don't know the actual numbers, but I presume that the real estate taxes alone put a hole in the city budget that was not gonna be easily repaired. And the one thing I know through sources is there was this sense among the designers and the Lower Manhattan Development Corporation that they didn't want a cemetery. They wanted that area to return to life. And I think in doing that, they may have gone too far. I mean, maybe the museum shouldn't have been there. Maybe it should have been at Long Island City. Maybe it should have been, you know, in Brooklyn. Maybe, maybe the, the memorial should have been on the site and the museum should have been somewhere far enough away that it could have been a building standing above ground. The original underground space was supposed to be a parking garage for buses. And then it became the museum. You know, I... The, see, that, that's a hard pill to swallow on top of everything else. Um, yeah, I mentioned Islamophobia. And there, you know, there, there's a great fear of that. Um, you know, just down the street, they built uh, that five-story uh, Islamic center and mosque. And right at the site was St. Nicholas Greek Orthodox Church that was destroyed when the towers came down. And there was also a lot of questions of St. Nicholas was privately funded by, by faithful of the Greek Orthodox and all the Eastern Orthodox sister churches to help pay to rebuild St. Nicholas, which was, I think, on the, on the site since 1921. But the, but the Islamic Center was fast-tracked. And, you know, there was always the complaint of why did the city take 20 years for St. Nicholas to reopen? I think it just reopened uh, six to eight months ago. Um, is that also a part of the issue with what happened at the tower that why could a church that was privately funded not be rebuilt, but the center that was, you know, two, three blocks away, you know, fast tracked. So I just want to say as an interviewer, I love how deep in this story you are and I appreciate it. Um, it, it makes it easier to talk about the film. You're asking exactly the right questions. You know, New York is, a, you know, so here's what I love about New York. Um, I'm a lifelong New Yorker. I love the diversity of the city. I love the fact that 127 languages are spoken here. Um, I love that, you know, it's a complicated place. And so in some ways, I think the World Trade Center site became the center of gravity of all this complexity, you know, of the diversity of the city, of Islamophobia, of, and, and, and there, there is a very large uh, Muslim American community that feels like the museum does in fact, you know, fuel Islamophobia. And, you know, the, I've spoken of one of the organizers and they saw the film, a whole bunch of them, and they thought the film, uh, their criticism of the film was that it didn't, they, they liked the scene about the rise of Al Qaeda film, but they thought the whole movie should have been about that. And, and, and that makes me smile because it's like, whenever somebody looks at your, your documentary and says, my issue fits into your frame here, like, and I've said to them, I think there should be another movie. I think you should, you know, find a way to make your movie. And we, if, if what the film ends up doing is being this center of gravity for all these conversations, then we've done our job. You know, you're, you're never going to make everybody 100% happy. And you only had 83 minutes to, to uh, you know, bring together a seven-year uh, event in putting this museum together. Also, the fact that, you know, you're Jewish and there's, we, we know what's going on in the Middle East, especially with Israel and Palestine. Is there, was there that effect of people going, well, it's the Jewish guy, of course, he's going to say something bad about Islam, you know, play into it when people either disregard the documentary or disregard what you're doing, you know, as kind of a dismissal thing, because we're so quick to dismiss these days. So you asked a good question. The answer is no, no one said that yet, but they will. Um, but when the museum was, the museum has been trying to find a way to fight the film and they, first they called it sloppy and inaccurate and then they kind of backed off on that. Um, the thing that they said most recently was they told the New York Daily News that the filmmakers and the museum have different ideological lenses. 
And, you know, I'm an English major. I've written two books. I, I'm a writer and I'm pretty good with words. And despite my best attempts to figure out what that means, uh, I can't, I mean, uh, it either means like, so I, we know what our ideological lens is, my, my filmmaking partner and I, and we're very clear about it. It's about freedom, free speech, open dialogue, discussion and debate. That's our ideological lens. And I have trouble believing the museum would be the diametric opposite of that. You know, with, with the way society has been the last handful of years, uh, cancel culture has become a huge part of this. And, you know, freedom of speech, freedom of expression, freedom of religion, you know, the entire First Amendment itself is kind of being put on the chopping block. And the fact that you want to express yourself and your film and the freedom of speech and the freedom of expression for this, and yet it almost feels as if the museum's trying to censor you in doing so, what does that say to the turn that America is taking? And should we not be terrified of this level of censorship? I mean, Twitter has censored a former president of the United States, albeit you know that's their business model. If that's what they want to do, let them do it. I don't care one way or the other. But, you know, there, there has to come a breaking point where, you know, like people have gone to the point of like, well, I disagree with that politician, so it's good they got canceled. But when it's my guy, oh my God, we got to pull back from this. Like, where do we find the balance of, I don't agree with you, but I will fight to the death to defend what you say? So you're asking a good question and it brings me to a really good answer. So... The film's getting made. We're going to be in theaters. We we know we're we know we're going to be on iTunes in September. The distributor, um, uh, Abamarama, um, who's um, uh, Karol Marchenko, who's also an executive producer on the film, comes to me in the early summer and he says, um, "What's the most impo important audience you want to reach?" And I said, I, "I want to reach an international audience. I think that we want to galvanize a conversation about 9/11 around the world." And uh, at that point, we were kind of at the end of a negotiation with Netflix that we weren't, we were pretty sure we weren't gonna be able to get done. Um, and he said, let me propose, what if we could be in 2.8 billion homes? And I'm like, did you say million or billion? He goes, no, no, billion with a B. I'm like, I don't know how we would do that. I mean, I think Netflix was 237 million homes or something like that. Um, and he said, I think we're going to be the first ticketed film to be released on Facebook. And I was like, all right. So we are going to be released on Thursday, August 19th. We're going to be on Facebook worldwide. We lowered the ticket price to $3.99. Um, and we're unbelievably excited about the potential for this to bounce around the world. Uh, and, you know, I think when you get outside off the, you know, outside of the confines of the US, you know, people around the world count on this democracy to function. And I think that, you know, people around the world, you know, still see America as this shining light on the hill, you know, the last 20 years of complexity notwithstanding. And I hope the film, uh, opens a conversation about exactly that, about free speech and free dialogue. You know, uh, I'm running out of time. I know you, you're very busy today and you have quite a few people and I can talk to you for the next nine, nine to 12 hours just on this topic. Uh, I, wanna, uh, I wanna make mention, you know, since I brought up the cancel culture thing, uh, you know, my family are immigrants. Uh, I have a lot of friends that are immigrants, friends from the former Soviet Union and Yugoslavia, my family from the Middle East. So anytime, we see a sense of, you know, post-Iran revolution, slight bit of, you know, uh, we want to we want to censor you here or what my friend survived in the Eastern Bloc or in Venezuela or wherever else feels like it's leading to tyranny instantaneously. It's one step closer. What do you say to those immigrants and those first generation born American people that saw their families endure that to the people that say, no, nope, canceling is fine. Censorship's fine. You know, I, we're, my wife and I are free speech absolutists. Um, we're, we, we're, we, we believe this country was built by immigrants. You know, my relatives were immigrants. Your relatives were immigrants. 
we don't under we we just don't understand how everyone doesn't look around. I mean, I get that people are different and they have different traditions and you eat different food than I do or you know pray to a different god or whatever that whatever that is. But it doesn't change the fact that if you don't think that what it makes America great is our diversity and our our that then I don't know, you know, I don't understand why you're here. And you know, so the film was made to you know to be a a a, a, a true north to ask that question. And when you go down to the museum memorial right now, and there's a sign that says you can't protest and you can't read a book of poetry and you can't play a guitar, like that sign has to come down. That makes no sense. Um, that's what the terrorists wanted the attack to to cause. And it seems like they're winning at this point. But Stephen Rosenbaum, oh, oh no, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. We can't leave it on that point. Oh, no, uh, I'm going to give you the yeah, final yeah, yeah. word because, All you know, right. I got to make right. that statement and then give you the final word and remind us on August 19th where we can find the film and everything else regarding right. The Outsider. Um, the answer is they're not winning. Um, uh, the city is as diverse as ever. Uh, the museum has some problems, but it's fixable. Um, it will get fixed. The city will come together. We'll have a new mayor. We'll have a new governor. New York's a kooky place. Um, just go onto Facebook and type in The Outsider and you'll, you'll immediately be brought to the event. Um, you can buy a ticket today and then Facebook will remind you. But it's also, you know, it'll, the film is going to make its way around the world. And uh, I would say to your audience, we'd love your feedback. We'd love your criticism. We'd love your support. We'd love you to share it with your friends and neighbors. Um, that's why we're here.